Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Margaret Groening, who died at the age of 94. And if her name doesn't sound familiar to you, think about her last name, Groening. She's the mother of Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, and she happens to be the inspiration for one of the most famous mothers in television history, Marge Simpson. Marge Groening didn't have the blue hair or four fingers on each hand. She had five, but for a while she did have one of those beehives. And like her television counterpart, she was a loving and talented mother with aspirations of her own. Here's a report on Marge Groening. The hit TV show, The Simpsons, is an iconic American cartoon. But sadly, the human inspiration behind one of the main characters has passed away. At the age of 94, Margaret Groening has died. She inspired the well-known character Marge Simpson, or Homer's wife. The show's creator, Matt Groening, developed The Simpsons lineup over two decades ago. Margaret was his mother. Her obituary stated, As high school valedictorian and Miss Everett, Margaret's highest honor was being named May Queen of Linfield College. She graduated from Linfield in 1941 and married classmate Homer Groening, whom she chose because he made her laugh the most. The Simpsons is said to be the longest-running scripted show in the history of television. Even after the show is canceled, the reruns will mean that Margaret Groening's inspiration will likely live on for generations to come. And what was that inspiration? Well, here's a little bit from the Marge book that Matt Groening wrote about Marge Simpson. Marge Simpson, the woman with the impossibly blue and improbably high hairdo, is a complex woman with an inner life, hopes and dreams, and an incorrigible family that she holds together with a healthy homemade helping of common sense. Join the coupon clipping queen of discount shopping at the nearby Sprawl Mart, at a meeting of the school PTA, in the middle of a bodice-ripping romance novel, at a theatrical performance of her one-woman show, or in her crusade against cartoon violence, domestic strife and suburbia's quiet life of desperation or at least her desperate hop that no one will hold anything that Homer or Bart does against her personally. So we say goodbye to Margaret Graney, who will go down as one of the great television moms that we've done here, along with Bonnie Franklin and Barbara Billingsley. We're going to move on now to Dr. Christian Duduve, who died recently at the age of 95. And Dr. Duduve was the discoverer of the lysosome. The lysosome is a cellular organelle that disposes of waste and fights foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Until the 1950s, little was known about the interior of the cell, the organelles, the small organs inside a cell. And Dr. Duduve, who was Belgian, split his time between the University of Louvain and the Rockefeller Institute in New York City, used an electron microscope to define the interior of the cell that helped regulate the cell's environment. For this, he and two of his colleagues, Albert Claude and George Pallade, won the 1974 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Dr. Duduve can truly be said to be one of the fathers of cell biology. Here's a report on what the lysosome does. Lysosomes are membrane enclosed vesicles that form in the Golgi apparatus. They may contain over 40 different powerful enzymes that enable the cell to digest and destroy large molecules. Intracellular digestion by lysosomes often executed by engulfing and chemically breaking down unwanted substances, is essential to a cell's survival. For example, lysosomes help white blood cells destroy foreign substances, such as viruses and bacteria that invade the body. Lysosomes also recycle older or damaged organelles. By engulfing selected organelles and digesting them with powerful enzymes, lysosomes return the digested components to the cytoplasm, where they can be reused. This process helps the cell to continually renew itself. Some organisms use lysosomes to break down food molecules that have been engulfed by their cells. For example, amoebas eat by engulfing small prey or food particles. Once inside the cell, small food vacuoles containing the captured substance fuse with lysosomes, which release their digestive enzymes. Later in his life, after he won the Nobel Prize, Dr. Duduf took his love for cell biology and tried to apply it to the evolution of life. Here in a round table with other scientists, he gives a stirring and concise lecture on the keys to evolution. Scientists are not supposed to have imagination, <laughs> according to the two culture uh, divide, and I think this is completely wrong. Scientists know, need as much imagination as uh, artists and philosophers. Uh, the only difference is that uh, scientists have to curb their imagination and have it fit with facts. So they're not free. 
as free as uh, writers or artists. They have to stick with facts. As far as the origin of life is concerned, we do have a few facts, which you may interpret one way or another. And the first fact that I would like to underline is the recent findings, last 20 or 30 years, that the chemical building blocks of life, amino acids, the sugars, the nitrogenous bases, the fatty acids, are made everywhere in the universe. Now, I won't go into the details, but let's say the main proof is the analysis of, of meteorites. Meteorites, at least in the solar system, these chemicals arise spontaneously. So what is called organic chemistry is really a banal chemistry. It's the chemistry of carbon. It's a natural chemistry of carbon. So the building blocks are made everywhere, which is, after all, an important point. The second point that we do know also with a considerable degree of confidence, if not certainty, is that all known living beings are descendants from a single ancestral form the so-called LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. Now, microbes, bacteria, protists, fungi, animals, plants, humans, we all are descendants of this single ancestral form that existed on Earth between three and a half and four billion years ago. That's a fact. I can go into the proof, but it's a fact. The third point, which I think is extremely important, maybe not a fact, but it's an inference that uh, we derive from all that we know about life, namely that in this long process from the building blocks of life, assuming they were, they served as building blocks in the origin of life, up to Luca, which is the ancestor of us all, this very long process, there is one very important landmark, a watershed. And that is the appearance by chemistry, which did all the stuff before, of molecules capable of replication. And what I mean is molecules capable of inducing the synthesis of copies of themselves. <coughs> they don't replicate themselves. They serve as copies for uh, some machine that makes the copying. And with these molecules, which almost certainly are RNA, with the appearance of these molecules, appeared for the first time in this pathway that was ruled by chemistry, appeared for the first time a phenomenon called replication. Replication is the ability to induce copies of themselves. If you have perfect replication, you have endless repetition of the same reproduction. That's the basis of genetic continuity. It's because they are owners of molecules that can serve in perfect replication that children resemble their parents more than they resemble the parents of other children. Mice beget mice, acorns, oak trees, whatever. Genetic continuity. Replication never being perfect. From time to time, you have imperfect copies that start by perfect replication lineages of variants. The variants compete, and in this competition, for resources in this competition, the most able to survive and especially reproduce under the existing conditions, which is the major point in this, you have selection. That's Darwin's major contribution. And he didn't know anything about DNA. He didn't know anything even about genes. And he came up with that. And that selection started the day the first RNA molecule appeared, together with the mechanism for uh, replication. And it's been going on ever since for three and a half or more billion years, chemistry plus selection. That's the history of life. As you can tell, Dr. Dube was extremely articulate, and I highly recommend the website NobelPrize.org, where there's a long interview with Dr. Dube, and he talks about science, his discoveries, and creating and fostering a culture of creativity. We're going to close tonight with our feature subject, Ray Harryhausen, who died recently at the age of 92. Ray Harryhausen was a master of special effects, but not just any special effects. He was the master of something called dynamation, which was the stop action that created those great dinosaur fights, that created those great mythological characters like you saw in Jason and the Argonauts, created those huge monsters like you saw in Mysterious Island, and created fighting skeletons. His greatest work was in Clash of the Titans in 1 million years B.C., 
He literally made these mythological characters and these dinosaurs come to life simply by photographing them in stop action and making them anatomically correct as far as we can ascertain scientifically. He's the guy responsible for the special effects in all those 50s movies where you have giant insects and squids destroying cities like London and New York. His biggest influence was the movie King Kong, which he saw when he was a little boy. Special effects in King Kong were done by the great Willis O'Brien, and he actually got to work with Willis O'Brien after World War II in his first big movie, Mighty Joe Young. Another influence on Ray Harryhausen was one of his friends in Los Angeles when he was growing up, Ray Bradbury, a great science fiction writer whose podcast we did a few months ago. They were friends for 50 years, and he was the best man at Ray Bradbury's wedding. By the way, Ray Harryhausen was married to Diana Livingston Bruce, who was a descendant of Livingston of Stanley and Livingston fame. Here's a report on Ray Harryhausen and his great work in the movies. In the royal family of fantasy films, there is one acknowledged godfather, Oscar-winning special effects genius Ray Harryhausen. His unique brand of stop-motion animation has influenced generations of filmmakers since the 1950s. And in 2003... Ray received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, across the street from Groman's Chinese Theater, where Ray first saw the movie that changed his life, 1933's King Kong. Wild, weird, wonderful, the stuff for which movies are made. Adventure, to make you wonder if it's true. Half the charm of King Kong when I first saw it at Grumman's Chinese at the age of 13 was that I didn't know how it was done. I knew it wasn't a man in a suit. The picture haunted me, particularly the animals, the fact that you could bring dinosaurs alive. And then my father had a friend who'd worked at RKO, and he told us all about stop motion and how they were puppets and and move frame at a time. So that intrigued me, and I started experimenting on my own as a hobby, because I used to make dioramas of the La Brea tar pits, uh, but they were all just models of prehistoric life. My introduction to Willis O'Brien came about when I was in high school, and he kindly invited me over to the studio, and I told him about my models, and I brought some over in a suitcase, and he gave me this advice that said my stegosaurus looked like the legs were sausages. They said, you've got to study anatomy. So I went back to school, night school, uh, while I was still in high school to study anatomy. One of the early characters I, I was making an experiment with was a cave bear for my proposed film, Evolution, which was never completed. And I needed fur for it, and I saw Mother's fur coat in the closet and uh, she didn't seem to want it anymore and I didn't get a spanking so I, I cut that up for the fur on my first cave I took some of my tests over to George Powell and showed them to him on my 16 millimeter projector and uh, he was very impressed because not many people knew much about stop motion so I got my first job with George Pal Puppetoons. And then Willis O'Brien started this film called Mighty Joe Young with Marion C. Cooper, who made Kong. He hired me as his assistant. So for about a year, I worked with him on preparing Mighty Joe. And then when the animation came along, he was too tied up getting the new setups made that I uh, did practically 90% of the animation. See Mighty Joe Young, enraged by Hollywood pranksters, destroy Filmland's swankiest nightclub on a fabulous sunset strip. My initial entrance into the film business, of course, was monster on the loose type of stories. I destroyed Rome with Emir, and I destroyed New York with the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and I destroyed San Francisco with an octopus. West Coast reels under Holocaust. A tidal wave of terror engulfs the screen as a raging monster from the dawn of creation attacks the world of man. Every inch of film that I've made, except on Clash of the Titans, I did every inch of animation myself. And I, I preferred to work that way because it requires enormous concentration. Some people find it very tedious. I never find it tedious. Flying 
these saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. In a Washington Monument fell over, each brick had to be put on a wire and animated frame by frame as the saucer knocked it over. Breathtaking spectacle. Hair-raising terror. I wanted to approach the whole fairy tale concept in a different way so that the monsters and the, the symbolic creatures uh, that you seldom see on the screen uh, were the stars. See the six-armed goddess of evil. And it developed that way. I didn't design it that way. I did it just to put science fiction and the, the uh, amazing image on the screen because no one else had done that. And I came across the Sinbad legends, which was ideal. See the spectacular battle between the one-eyed cyclops and the fire-breathing dragon. The incredible magic of Dynorama recreates the enchanted, breathtaking adventure that could never be told before. In our early days, when these films, even Mighty Joe Young, came on the screen, the critics would call it animation. And everybody thought it was a cartoon, so we've coined the word Dynamation. Dynamation, miracle of the screen, captures the whole marvelous, miraculous story of man's first journey to the moon. I found a whole new avenue for stop motion in the legends of Sinbad, and later the next step, of course, was Greek mythology. Jason and the Argonauts, caught on the clutches of the towering bronze giant Talos. Wake up! Talos, the bronze man, that was a challenge. I got criticized many times by critics saying that it was jerky, but I deliberately made him mechanical looking because he was supposed to be made of bronze. Jason and the Argonauts facing the dreaded seven-headed Hydra. Battling the merciless army of skeletons. I find the skeletons are some of my best friends as well. They were a challenge to do seven skeletons fighting three men. And I get a lot of fan letters saying they prefer our films to the new CGI even. One million years B.C. Primitive man and monstrous beasts fought each other to inherit the earth. I've always felt that stop motion has this added advantage of giving you this dream quality of a nightmare, which I think is essential to fantasy. And if you make fantasy too real, I think you make it mundane. I'm grateful that our films are looked upon as more than just entertainment. It does my heart good to see at some of these conventions when a family of three generations come up to me and say, my father saw your film and taught me to look at your film and my teaching my children, would you please sign these? You've made my childhood, you know? And I'm grateful that our films have done more than just entertain people. Here, here he has an influence, a lot of people. He influenced the movie directors like Spielberg and Lucas. He influenced people to go into things like paleontology and mythology. Once said his favorite character was the Medusa from Clash of the Titans. I gotta admit that's my favorite too. But in the end, Ray Harryhausen was sort of a dinosaur. Clash of the Titans in 1981 was his last big movie. After that, he was basically replaced by CGI, computer generated imagery. But the computers couldn't replicate what he did exactly. And if you look closely, I think you'll see the skill and the artistry that went into his work. Unfortunately, it was expensive, it was time consuming, and I don't think we're going to see it again. So Ray Harryhausen was definitely the last master of his craft. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. Ray Harryhausen's breakthrough movie was Mighty Joe Young in the 40s. It was a knockoff of King Kong. And I'm going to play a song by Shocking Blue. That was the Dutch group that had a number one worldwide hit with Venus in the 1960s. But they also had another hit. It wasn't as big a hit, but it had a great guitar riff. And it should have gotten more airplay. And it was called, what else? Mighty Joe. So as a final tribute to Ray Harryhausen, here is Venus with their 1969 hit, Mighty Joe. <laughs> Yeah.